Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 176. If you like Century Spice Road, try out these other games. We'd like to thank our Patreon backers for helping us bring you a brand new episode. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast with board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. Hey, and this is Anthony. Anthony, convention season continues. Another great episode here. Everything's all about board games this coming month, right? So many board games. I have a, literally a huge pile sitting behind me right now in my office of stuff I have to play, which <laughs> is like this funny thing that happens every summer of like simultaneously being like excited and overwhelmed. So I'm in between some of these games I'm excited about, some of them over overwhelmed about, and then Gen Con is only four or five weeks away and that's all yeah. overwhelmed so it's really funny everyone's like it's getting hot out there we gotta get down to the beach you know sand 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 i'm going sand i'm like cardboard cardboard now is the time for cardboard <laughs> so much cardboard <laughs> <laughs> yes it's cardboard season not sun season get those air conditions going get that cardboard out to the table drop those chits get those coins there's a lot of great board gaming going on right now. Origins recently wrapped up. Gen Con's just around the corner. And obviously PAX Unplugged and Essen is a little bit down the way. But we got some brand new games for you to talk about on this episode. And for our feature review, we are going to talk about Century Spice Road. Since it just popped up big time on the hotness. Because recently it's, I guess, little brother or little sister came out. It's kind of reemerged as this great gateway game. Probably everyone's been playing it since last year. It's a really fine gateway game. And we wanted to kind of take you through a little bit of what other games you might play if you do like Century Spice Road. So we got a lot of fun stuff to talk about and a lot of things that we want to keep you up to date on. So let me let you know what we're doing with BGA. If you are in the Tri-State area, I will be at Dexcon 2018. This is a great board gaming convention, probably the biggest one they have each and every year by double exposure. Our friends Vinny and Avi, everybody over there really does a great job. It's a great convention if you are looking to play games, meet a couple of different vendors, and just have a really chill time. It's going to be right around the 4th of July weekend, so if you happen to be in the area, definitely check out. And finally, I just want to talk briefly, but I think it's important to make a mention because I know it's been on a lot of the Reddit groups. It's been on Board Game Geek. It's actually been in probably some of the mainstream media that there was several incidents that, that were reported of sexual harassment at the Origins Game Fair. And I thought we would just give a little time to talk about this and our reaction and, and how we feel about this. Did you hear about this, Anthony? I did right around the time our last episode published and you know I was a little remiss that we didn't have a chance to talk about this on our actual origins episode we were talking about all the great things at the show and all this news comes out about you know harassment and inappropriate behavior by certain individuals at origins towards women who were you know part of the hobby and just trying to enjoy the hobby and interact with people and cover the show and you know this has been kind of an ongoing conversation and issue in all media not just board games but in movies and tv and music and everything politics you know the last year and a half as part of the me too movement and it's just to see it in our own hobby in a show that we were at is it's upsetting we didn't personally necessarily see it but just to know it was there it's, it's upsetting and definitely worth talking about especially when board gaming is such a social activity and it's such a intimate activity in a lot of ways where you're going to spend, you know, dedicated, focused time with a couple of other people at a small table, engage in a specific activity where all your attention is drawn and you really want to invite everyone to the table and all different types of people do come to the table. And since it's a small industry and we are such a niche kind of entertainment area, 
to hear that there were people in the industry that were acting totally inappropriate to fellow gamers is extremely upsetting. I know that there were other comments on some Facebook and people talking about what wasn't said or what was said, but in the end, straight up and straight down, we've been on for five years now. You know our podcast, you know our general motto, we wanna bring everyone to the table. We're always saving you a seat at the table. We've done several episodes about positive representation, especially female representation. You can go back and listen to those episodes because Anthony and I are uniquely aware of that because we've run so many different game events. We want to have our family at the table. There's a lot of female members of our family, but not just female members, but there's a lot of members of the minority community. There's a lot of members of different international and different backgrounds that we want to have to come to the table. Sometimes games interfere or limit that interaction and sometimes it's gamers and anthony and i could sit here probably for the next 12 hours and tell you about all of these unfortunate incidents and interactions we had with gamers in the past but typically we do our best to host and to be hospitable to everybody and then you move on but there are definitely opportunities and definitely situations where certain gamers are not allowed to do that and they can't find a safe haven they can't find a table to play at and no one should ever be encountered with a negative situation, especially of a sexual matter, especially at a board game convention of all places. So it's really the worst thing that probably could happen in a kind of a family social kind of environment. It's just negativity that's not needed. We do not support that one bit. Obviously, there's a lot of information you can go on Board Game Geek or Reddit or read the news articles that are out there. Board gaming, I would say 99% of the time, great people, everybody in the industry is friendly, welcoming, and you know, you go to these places, you go to Columbus, you go to Annapolis, you go to Philadelphia, you go to New York, Jersey, Boston, all these different places around the country and around the world, and I would say nine times out of ten times, people are willing to let you sit down and play, and there's usually a great interaction. We cannot allow this kind of negative interaction and just this just rottenness of people sometimes, allow that to fester. We have to say something. And then we hope that everyone out there, if you are hosting a game event or if you're just sitting at a game table and somebody has something negative to say about somebody else, even if it's not about you specifically or in reference to your background, gender, nationality, sexual orientation, you need to stand up and say something. You need to make a comment. It doesn't have to be a fight. It doesn't have to be a big issue but you need to let the other person know that that's not acceptable at the table. When you do that, it really sets the standard and brings more people to the table, and we just have a better time gaming overall. Yeah, I, I couldn't say it better myself, and that, that, I think that's the most important thing to talk about. Like, If you see it, if you experience it, if you're part of it, do something, say something, be engaged, be part of the solution, don't just ignore it, because if you ignore it, you're part of the problem, kind of, and that's not... It's just going to persist then. Like people aren't going to feel the pressure and, and understand that this is not acceptable behavior. And we need to push this out of our hobby, make sure it's not part of this discussion, make sure this doesn't happen again at any other con in a way that, you know, makes it so people feel uncomfortable or unable to do the things that they want to do as part of these conventions. And I know this is not like the first time this has happened. You know, we've read things about, you know, people coming out and speaking out about previous cons or just being a minority or being a woman in gaming and dealing with this all the time and now it's just the time to talk about it and that's not okay but let's make this the time to stop it we don't need to continue this and if you see this if you're part of this if you're doing this you know stop it say something be part of it and you know hopefully we can make this uh, a safe acceptable fun place for everybody Absolutely. And if you're, you know, with Team BGA, then you are an ally. And there's nothing better than being an ally at the game table for everyone that's there. All right, Anthony. So that's what's going on with us and going on with the industry. What's going on with our listeners? What's our question of the week? Okay, so moving on from the unfortunate, we're going to talk about things that make people happy. I ask people, what is their gaming guilty pleasure? There's an easy way to take this of oh, I don't think there's anything to be guilty about. Or, yeah, I understand this game is horrible, but I still love it. And I think the latter is kind of what I meant. But for everybody out there who is not ashamed of anything they play, I salute you. Because, like, I'm occasionally still guilty of feeling ashamed of certain games that I play. So, 
running through the list, um, we have people who mentioned Munchkin several <laughs> times. <laughs> I think three or four different people mentioned Munchkin. George mentioned Risk. Kyle, um, who we actually met at Origins, he seconded Risk. I think Risk is like another common one. Chris mentioned Boss Monster, as well as Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, specifically playing it solo, which I kind of agree with, because every time I play that solo, I feel like I should be playing with my friends, but I much prefer playing it by myself. And once I've played it by myself, I'm not going to play with my <laughs> friends, because <laughs> I've already solved it. We have Settlers of Catan came up several times as well. That's kind of the uh, the hot game to to dump on lately. I don't think there's anything wrong with that game necessarily, especially if you're new to the hobby. But, you know, people have been in the hobby for a while. You get a little down on it. Arkham Horror was in here three or four times. And I can kind of see that because that is a very popular game with a very popular theme that has been supplanted and upgraded in several ways. Through the card game, through Eldritch Horror, through just a lot of other Arkham Files games. It comes up a lot. One Night Werewolf, Alien, etc. That comes up a lot. Um, as a game that people really uh, like, but sometimes feel like uh, it's not really a gamery game. Kind of depends on your group, I guess. Uh, for me personally, it's the word games. Uh, I got games like Scrabble and Paperback and Hardback. Uh, you know, these games that are all about like what your vocabulary and putting together words. I love these games, but I know the other people in my groups don't always love these games. When I first came to a board game group where I met Chris, <laughs> honestly... Um, it was because I was looking up groups to go play Scrabble with. So <laughs> that is the game that kind of got me into hobby board games on accident. And I still love it. I don't play it very often anymore, but it, I still love it. And um, I'm not ashamed of that, mostly. I've said this many times before. I like playing Munchkin. I'm a fan of Munchkin. I like tableau building. I like the thematic gameplay that comes with a lot of the different Munchkins. And, you know, anytime I could build a thematic tableau, put those two together, I'm really happy about that. I think I'm the only podcast host who actually admits to that. So if Steve <laughs> Jackson Games is listening, this is the guy. It's me, okay? Beyond that, I think that, you know, we started Board Gamers Anonymous because part of the situation was the fact that, you know, board gaming was a guilty pleasure. Being a completionist was an extreme guilty pleasure because... You had to explain to people that, yes, the game was $45, but it has three promos, and each of those promo cards, individual cards, were $5 each. So you, in, in effect, you know, were almost paid as much for those cards as you did the game, which you start to realize there, there might be an issue here going into it. So I, I guess everything about the hobby is a guilty pleasure in a way, but it's a great guilty pleasure. And it's usually cardboard related. So how bad could it possibly be? So bad. <laughs> All right. It is so bad. But you get to have a podcast that can kind of go down there with you. So you got to feel a little bit about that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I didn't even mention it. Like there was like three people who just said Kickstarter. Like, like, and I'm like, mm, yeah, I think I'm on that one. And I'm on board with that. The funniest one. story, and I'll tell it really quick, was – I left game night from the game store one night and it had to be a Sunday night and it was about 2 a.m. We wrapped up playing a late game. I was driving home and getting from the game store to my house was a strip club. And of course, there was a police stop <laughs> right after the strip club because they were catching, I guess, everybody was drunk coming from the strip club. And it was a long line of cards and this female officer came up to me and she said, you know, sir, license registration. Uh, where were you tonight? And I was going, all right, 2 a.m. <laughs> Monday morning. What could I say that would actually be cool and not extremely embarrassing that I was playing board games at 2 in the morning on a Sunday night or Monday morning? Do I want to get arrested or do I want to be embarrassed? And that was one of those things that <laughs> I had to really think long and hard about. Yeah, that's when it kind of hits you. That's a, it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, I think I think embarrassment wins out over arresting. So. <laughs> All right, Anthony, that's it for our question of the week. Let's get on to our acquisition disorders where we can talk more of our ongoing guilty pleasures. So, Anthony, what has caught your eye? I have a game that actually just released this last week. I didn't know it was going to release. I put this on the calendar. And thinking it was coming out in several weeks. And voila, I was at my local game store. So this is a game you might see on the shelves. And you're thinking, what is this game? It's called Starship Samurai. And 
So there's two reasons why you might be interested in this game. One is it's called Starship Samurai, right? Great name, great theme, giant samurai mechs just look amazing. Second, Isaac Vega is the designer in this game. He worked on Dead of Winter. He worked on the Ashes Mm -hmm. series. He's very prolific. He works with Plaid Hat. Very good stuff. And this is one of his newest creations. And a lot of people are talking about it. It's got some light buzz building. Plaid Hat has this habit lately of releasing games and not really talking about them. I blame Asmodee. And um, so we have like Crystal Clans, which is a great two-player card game, and nobody's talking about it. And you then you have this, which they had a demo of at Origins, and that was it. Hadn't heard about it otherwise. Um, it is in the same ballpark of like a Kemet or a Cyclades or a Blood Rage or you know these kind of area controlish Euroe games. You start the game with two samurais, which you draft at the beginning of the game. And so they're not specific to your faction. And then you have a carrier and some fighters. And all of these miniatures sit in front of you. And then you have four actions on every round um, with a one, two, three, or four. And each of these represents how many times you can do each of these acts. So you will then place each of these numbers on one of the four action spots you have. So one of them is to gather resources. One of them is to place people on on the map. One of them is to move people on the map. And you're going to put all these things out there, almost purely an area control game. There's four different sectors. Each of these has a card on them. And you're trying to get guys out there, manipulate it, and try to walk away with control of these different sectors. So you win the card, get the various boosts that you get. Um, There's eight different factions that you can kind of manipulate, and these all bump up, and they all give you different control levels of different things. So... Um, they're going to go up your own personal tracks. Now, the interesting thing here is if you get one of these specific factions based on the cards you get, you can move it down on somebody else's track and then up on your own, depending on how far it goes. So if so, if it's on like level one on somebody else's track and you get a plus minus three, then you can move it down one on their track and then up two on your track which is great there's a lot of like thinking about how these different things interact with each other and where you want to move them the game is very simple it takes maybe five to ten minutes to teach it's not a big sprawling board it's not modular it's this tiny little board it's four little boards with cards on them that determine how many points you get based on how many people you have out there's some basic interactions with the different fighters you have the real big powers come with those samurai which are these, like again, like Gundam-style samurai that you put out. They're giant miniatures. They're amazing. And they determine more or less how this is going to break down and when you put them out and how you put them out. Some of them are very powerful. They'll say, like, if this is the only samurai in this sector, they're plus four strength. Or this one can move this many guys around and impact the different you know levels and places that everybody is at. It's, it's very powerful. The main issue I have with the game, and again, I haven't played this in full. So I played like a demo, which is like, I think a third of the game. So the main issue I have is the Samurais are drafted. Some seem more powerful than others. I haven't played enough to know. So I wanted to play it more to know which one's better and which one's not. And then you have the issue of like knowing who Samurai is who. Like they need to be tagged somehow because they're drafted. You need like rings or tags or some way to know like who owns which one on each area the miniatures like the fighters and the, the ships are all color-coded this is fine it's it's a tough game to really get my head around at this point uh having not played it in full but j- just those first couple you know rounds of it it's it's really interesting i like the idea behind it i really like the miniatures i really like the basic simple approach it seems like a one to two hour game which is awesome i, I haven't picked it up yet even though it was there at the store but I'm hoping to get another play in soon. And that is Starship Samurai. Hopefully I'll have a review for you guys in the next couple months. Well, Starship's good. Samurai, very good. And I guess putting them together even better. The miniatures obviously is what tends to drive this, especially as far as you know, uh, getting your initial attention. But as far as table's presence is concerned, do you think that mechanically this is heavy enough? I mean, they're quoting this as being a weight of a three not even close no this is lighter than Kemet. it's lighter than all those other games like you have four cards in front of you you're gonna draw other cards from various actions one of the actions is to draw cards and those cards can break Mm -hmm. things and do things and manipulate the board in different ways and you need those cards to actually impact the play 
those cards will also impact combat, which happens at the end of each of the rounds. So, like, combat will determine who ultimately wins out in each of these sections, but I don't feel like combat's nearly as complex as some of these other games that it's comparing itself to. <sighs> Maybe a three, slightly below three, I don't know. It's It's in that ballpark of those other games, but there's less stuff to keep track of. It's all in front of you. It's very simple to teach, and... I honestly feel like it's the kind of game like the person who's played it the most is going to do the best because they know all the cards. They know the combinations. Sure. It's like gotcha. Kemet, for example, it's all in front of you. You can read it all like it's a mess and it's a bit of AP, mm-hmm. but it's all there. This is not that because it's a deck of cards and the rest of it's fairly simple. It's definitely not a heavy game. All right. Well, I want to talk about a game that also has a lot of that beautiful look to it. This is Tang Garden. Now, this you might be familiar with this company. They came out with Dead Man's Doubloons, Tao Long, Overseers, a lot of beautiful artwork and a lot of simplistic, elegant design to their gameplay. Now, Tang Garden is all about building up these iconic gardens in the Tang Dynasty. So what you're going to see in this current Kickstarter that's running right now, and right now they're doing quite well. Uh, they look like they're pushing all their goals, and this will eventually back on Tuesday, July 10th. So you'll probably have a week or so amount of time by the time you listen to this episode. So if you are interested in this campaign, definitely check it out. This game, at least from just the ba- the bare looks at it, it's absolutely gorgeous. The cover artwork for the box, it has extraordinary miniatures that are going to come and play. But also, a lot of these 3D cardboard representations of trees and temples that come into the play. But the basic game mechanics is going to be all about tile placement. Placing tiles on this board in a particular way will activate certain features on your tableau. It will activate certain character cards and allow you to be able to collect and score these different decoration cards throughout the game. Now, as I said, there are these 3D miniatures. So this is a just a really eye-catching presentation here. Great artwork, great graphic design, but basically it's on the lighter side as far as a, I would say, a tile placement along, I guess, like Carcassonne. But once you place those tiles, a lot of other things happen. So it adds a little more depth to it. Now, these different character cards that come in the game are very diverse. There's going to be some background cardboard that you're going to be able to pop up. There are going to be some special tokens, depending on where you place those tiles. It's going to activate the tokens. You're going to be able to extend your garden to bring new things into play. And basically, you're shaping the landscape around the board, decorating the board, bringing in new characters. You're going to be able to utilize special abilities on your player board. And it's a very, for lack of a better term, it's a very zen-like game. Think as far as maybe Takanoko or Takaido, as far as not just having that Asian aesthetic to it, but also having that very much kind of engaging, but very serene mechanic where you're just building up this beautiful garden and you're utilizing these outstanding different miniatures and 3D pieces to come into play just to score points. A very laid back, chill game and uh, something that's worth backing. What do you think, Anthony? I 100% agree because I've already backed it. So, (laughs) well, there you go. My job is done here. <laughs> done! Thundergriff Games makes really beautiful stuff. Like, I, I backed how long. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's a fantastic production. This game looks really, really good. And, like, I feel like I was backing it before I even read about the mechanics. I was just like, this is so pretty. I'm in. Um, yeah. And, and then I read about it, and I was like, well, now I'm definitely in. So, you didn't get me this time, because I backed it before you told me about it. So... All right, well, let me try one more on you. I'm going to talk about Folded Space, which is board game inserts and organizers. It's their second campaign. Their first campaign already backed, and people are really happy with this. And this is an expansion. So basically, they already have these inserts out and available, but they want to kind of expand their product line so people can pick up these kind of specialized inserts for their bigger games. Now, What's really special about these inserts, and I got a chance to put together these myself, is they do some things that are actually surprisingly better than the typical wooden inserts. First off, they're lighter. 
And I can't begin to tell you how much that is of great importance when it comes to holding your board games around. The wooden inserts are great. They look really nice, but they weigh a ton. And typically, every once in a while, because it's wood and because maybe glue doesn't work as well as it should or those seams don't work as good as they should, when you're moving them in and out, they can kind of fall apart based upon the weight. I haven't had that problem here because what basically what you're looking at here is kind of this foam core insert. So it's soft, but it's strong and it doesn't have those kind of odd seams and it doesn't have that soft wood that you find in some of the inserts. So when you're trying to kind of pull it from the, the punch board, it, it doesn't give you that kind of problem. And when you're putting the pieces together, you don't have to worry about things splintering. That's great. These inserts allow space for the sleeves. They allow space for the expansions. They allow pieces to come out so it can aid in gameplay. And, and most importantly, you can actually close the lid flush. And that's pretty important because when you want to hold these games on the side, if you can't hold that lid flush, it's going to be a problem. These inserts are pretty economical, especially if you're looking for something for the larger game. They have about two dozen inserts right now available. This is a campaign on Kickstarter, and it will be back on Saturday, July 7th. So that by the time you listen to this episode, you only have a couple of days to check it out. That is Folded Space Board Game Inserts and Organizers Campaign 2. Check it out if you're looking for something new and different, lighter, but I would say better put together than some of the other inserts. Not fancy, very straight, very utilitarian. But it works pretty well. Yeah, I'm all about like just function. Yeah, you know? and like not having to like have the extra like centimeter of two of space above the box. Like anytime it says that, I'm out. Yeah, and the cost. The cost is huge. Like something simple and folded and just straightforward and it fits. I'm all about it. Yeah, I'm all about it. It's it's a challenge here. We want to get the games to the table more often. We want to have them well maintained within the box. Obviously, some of these inserts are beautiful, but sometimes they really aren't useful at the game table or they just sit in the box and you really don't get the, the flavor of it. So this is really a nice addition to the kind of game insert selection. All right, Anthony, that's our acquisition disorders. We're not feeling guilty about those at all. Let's get on to the things that we actually got to the table. So, Anthony, what did hit your table this week? This is actually a good one because this is a game that I've had two other people ask me where to get and... The answer was, you can't get it, so I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this is Quimbra. This is the new game from Eggertspiel, uh, being distributed in the U.S. by Plan B Games. And we both got a copy at Origins. We did. Uh, and it is not available in the U.S. in general, I think, until August. So they had a few hundred copies there. We were in the line early. We picked it up. We've both played the game. We have. But I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So this is a game by a, a designer we both know and love well. Um, he has been behind some of our other favorite games, Virginio Gili. And he worked on games that we all know, like Grand Austria Hotel, Lorenzo Il Magnifico. Ironically, he worked on a game that my kids love right now that I brought home recently, Dino World from Hava Games, which is like flicking cards at dinosaurs. But this particular game is a medium weight euro, and it is all about dice drafting. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about. We're talking about dice drafting in this game. And it is similar in a lot of ways to a game like Lorenzo. The, the dice really matter. They're a shared resource, and you're all working together. But it's different in several ways as well. So let's run through it really quick. There's a lot of mechanics here. I'll try to keep it short because we don't want to get in that mechanic well. But the basic idea is at the beginning of every round, you roll all these dice. There are three of every color. There are four different colors. And there's a white die. So you have 13 dice. You adjust this a little bit if you have less than four players. But we'll keep it at four for now for now, to be, keep it simple. The gray track is all about shield you know, basically the, the city defense resource, that's one of the resources you have to spend. It's a, it's a currency of sorts. The orange is all about the gold, which is another currency. The purple is all about moving around a map. There's a map in the middle of the board, and each of the spaces on the map has a different bonus or extra special thing you can do. And the green is just victory points, all about the victory points. So there's those four different tracks. And when you draft these dice, you put them in your own little personal castles, these little plastic castles, and they fit right in there. And then you place them in one of four spots. You can put them in the top in the in the castle spot, and there are four special tiles you can draft from. Um, 
And the way that works is the lowest die goes first, you pick your own special thing, and then it goes up from there. So you could get victory points and move a guy in the map. You could get a discount on investing in different voyages. Voyages give you victory points at the end of the game. You can get just money or shields, or you can get, you know, different uh, special bonuses here that otherwise wouldn't be available to you, it's be- including one that allows you to increase the value of a die that you're going to use later. The other three spaces all correspond to one of three different rows of cards. Each of those rows has four cards in it. Each of those cards does one of many different things. Every single card has a influence value on it, which is how far you're going to move up on one of those four tracks I mentioned. And then it's going to have some kind of special ability. So the ability might be something you get immediately, some cool special effect you get, uh, money or shields or movement on the map or points or several other cool things. Sometimes they hurt other people, but not always. Those are fairly rare. They, They take that cards. There are cards that will activate during the influence, uh, income phase, which happens after everybody drafts all these dice. And so those are things that will just give you, you know, extra bonuses that you get once every round for the rest of the game. There are four rounds in the game. Um, and there are other cards that are end game scoring cards. There are only a few of those. I think there's eight or nine of them total out of the entire game. These are things like whoever's, you know, how high you are in each of the four tracks or how many cards you have with a one, two value or a three, four value. Keep that in mind because there's only so many in the game. And at the beginning of the game, you start with a few starting cards some of them are discounts some of their bonuses it it really depends on how you want to start you draft them to begin the game and that's basically it the game is fairly simple it takes 10 minutes to teach you know everything i've told you is more or less all the mechanics of the game and you know it gets a little more in depth people have questions about what all those tiles do on the map and what all the different card icons do and all the voyage cards do but the basic idea is every round you draft a die You place it in one of those four spots, you do that three times, and then you activate those dice, and then you take those dice back, and you use them for income. That's pretty much it. And then invest in a voyage if you want to. There's four rounds in the game. Because of how streamlined that is, even with four players, even with everybody thinking very thoroughly about what they want to buy and how they want to buy it, it's a one and a half to two hour game, tops. It's streamlined. It's pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of stuff in here to really drag people down except for the drafting. It can be mean. There are some take that cards. There are some spots where you can block people. Um, It doesn't happen as often as you might think it would, but it does happen. And it's something to keep in mind. And it's definitely along the lines of, you know, some of these other games that he's worked on, like Lorenzo and, you know, these dice based games, but it's a little more open. It's a little more accessible. It's it's definitely not as heavy as those other games. Now, in terms of things I have issues with, um, I wish there was more cards. You use every single card in every game you play, regardless of player count. That's a little tough. You know, you know, like people who've played the game a lot and know what cards are coming out. People who haven't played at all don't know them at all. That's not... You know, anytime that happens, it's a little tough on people. Um, the The map is incredibly important. There, you know, there's several different spots in the map. I think there's 12 or 13 total. And the, the level three things on the map are worth a lot of points. If you play them right, they can be worth 20 to 30 points each if you get to them. That means if you get to them and nobody else does, you probably win the game. So... It's important to explain to people early that the map is important, um, that you want to try to reach those or to mitigate that in some way. You don't have to get there to win the game, but it really matters if you do. And the, you know, maybe even like I think, Chris, you and I talked about this a little bit, like see the map a little bit. If you have new players in the game, like don't put those things out that are worth so many points, you know, try to make it a little more balanced early on. And I don't think it's broken in terms of the game. If everybody knows that or if you talk to everybody, it's fine. It's just I'd like more, like more of these options. Keep it randomized a little bit more cards, maybe some other mechanic to mitigate the map a little bit more. I really, really enjoy this game, and I've had multiple people, when I brought it out, ask me to bring it out again. It's rare that I get a new game out, and then people ask me to bring it out over and over again. So I've played this game several times since Origins. I've been bringing it out basically every game night at this point. But as somebody who's now played it every single one of those times, I think there are areas that it could be improved upon. So um, 
it's a very strong play. I would almost push it to a buy, but keep in mind, this is a $70 game. You know, it's up there with Eggerspiel's other games, Heaven and Ale, and 70 bucks for this Euro that takes an hour and a half to play, that needs a couple, maybe an expansion or two to kind of flesh out a few of these areas. I love it. It's not quite a buy. Uh, what do you think, Chris? Well, if I can't take credit for your acquisition disorder, I'm going to take credit for this because this was my acquisition disorder, I think, the first week of February. In particular, because, as you mentioned, amazing artwork, great production here, and the dice mechanics are outstanding. That being said, I think, like you said, too, $70 is a large price tag for this game. Now, you are getting a lot of great pieces of artwork, and artwork is expensive. But I think, like you said, Anthony, we talked about this before the podcast, the game is not as heavy or complex as it should be at that price point. And to its benefit, it really should be a little bit heavier, a little more complex. The map is great. The dice are great. The cards are great. But it just needs one more thing. It needs one separate area, something else that you have to do, something else that kind of is, you know, draws your attention. Because otherwise, it's a great hour and a half game that if you can get on discount, it's absolutely worth the buy. But for the $70 price tag, it's a solid play. 100% agree. Yeah, and it, it's a funny game, too, because, like, the first time I played it, I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. And I was, like, ready to give it a buy. Yes. Like, and then I played it again, and I was, like, starting to see a couple of the cracks. And the third time through was, like, two people who played it all three times and two people who just played it for the first time. I was like, oh, you know what? I don't know. Like, there are some issues here. This is an issue of the map. You know, the way the cards kind of are sure. the same. And I know, like... In the th in the third round, a bunch of green cards came out. So I knew personally that in the fourth round, a bunch of orange cards were going to come out. I told everybody, but I could have not told everybody, right? Sure. Um, they didn't know that. And, and, you know, as teaching the game, of course I told them. But that's an issue. Like, if you're, like, these things where it's random, like, it's exactly the same cards. It's always the same. The map is randomized. I'll give them credit for that. The The tiles do randomize. There are different varieties of those that come out. But there are issues here that don't quite get it to a buy, even if that first play is amazing. So I agree. I think an expansion to this game would bring it up to a buy and maybe make move it on to like a modern day classic. All right, Anthony, I want to talk to you about one of the Origins games that I picked up that is not out yet either. This is called Roundhouse. Now, Roundhouse is going back to the area of the Ming Dynasty in the 17th century in which a large roundhouse, a large multi-floor enclosure, would house several different clans. Now, these different clans and families are trying to live a prosperous life, live together with these other families, but yet at the same time trying to gain glory. Now, this game is published by Deep Water Games, but it originally comes from Emperor S4 Games, and they have a lot of beautiful designs out there, so you definitely should check those things out. Now, what this game boils down to is kind of a little bit of a recreation of the roundhouse. So on the board itself, you get this beautiful little roundhouse, kind of a bird's eye view, and what you're looking at is basically two rondelles. Now, rondelles basically two circles here in this case, and you are taking your family leader and you are deciding where you want to place your family leader. You have three spaces in which you can move your family leader up to, and you can move them on the inner circle or the outer circle, and there are some stairs that connect them, but once you pass a point, you got to go all the way around to come back to that again. So you want to utilize your steps in the best way possible to gain you the maximum amount of victory points. Now, what you're doing in this game is a couple of different things. So first off, you are trying to collect sets of amulets. Now, the amulet selections come basically two different ways. First off, you're going to be able to collect these. You're going to collect these expert cards that could have an amulet on their card. You'll save that card in the game, and that'll help you with your set collection. In addition to that, there is this small board on the bottom left in which once you go all the way around and end up at the ancestral section, then you are going to be able to place your assistants on this board and by move, by placing them orthogonally, 
you'll be able to hit a certain victory point condition, get resources for that area, and if it's available, you'll also be able to pick up an amulet. So once again, kind of moving up that amulet set collection. Finally, if this tile is available, so it may, may or may not be part of that amulet selection, is there is one of the small pieces that's randomized that could come into the game, and then you would place your family leader there and then exchange money for amulets. So that is going to be your big kind of opportunity to score points. But you'll score points throughout the game. You can buy points throughout the game. You can trade resource cubes throughout the game. And basically what you're trying to do is trade those resources for money, trade those monies for resources, get amulets throughout the game, and then put your family assistants out on the board in these different chair spaces so that you're able to use them as an additional action to be able to use that section again. In addition to that, as you're placing those people around, there's a traveling market that's going and you can drop your workers off in those different villages. And then when you finally get back to the ancestry section, this once again is where you'll get your amulet tokens by placing your assistants on the board. It's not a very complex game. It looks a lot more complex than it is. And basically, you're going to be scoring victory points mostly by fulfilling these different contracts that are going to be requiring different resources or different money. Once you complete those contracts, they'll turn into kind of like a special ability, which you'll be able to get throughout the game. And that will score you victory points. Now, that's important because scoring victory points throughout the game is needed because that's going to allow you to get more contracts. I've never seen that before in a game. But it's a very, very interesting mechanic. Scoring victory points early on to get you more contracts, to get you more special abilities. And once again, you're going to play this until everyone has placed their people at some point on the ancestry track enough times based upon the number of people that it hits that final amulet and that ends the game. It's a medium weight to light game. It looks a lot heavier than it is. And as I mentioned before, not only that one tile with the amulets is available, but there are three large tiles that always come out. And then there are five smaller tiles, which you will kind of randomly select a place on the board. Just like Queenbra, I'm going to recommend putting that amulet tile out and then using whatever other two come out because you really want to have that on the board. You don't really want to play the game without it. The expert cards are great. The artwork is fantastic. The contract cards are pretty generic, but they're, they're pretty straightforward. You need these cubes, this money for these resources. The ancestry area where you're going to be able to place your workers and then turn them into an elder worker in order to kind of score resources and gain amulets is fun, but it's really limited. This game ends fairly quickly for what it should be. There should add a little bit more to the game. Now, there are two small expansions that are available with this game. They're not ex like expansion games as far as all these different components. They just add a couple of new things to them. The first expansion comes with these pirate smuggling tiles. That's one of the mechanics in the game. If you land on this pirate section, you'll be able to get pretty much random kind of resources or money. The pirate section is extremely powerful, probably too powerful. So these pirate smuggling tiles in the first expansion kind of nerfs that a little bit. And I think that's highly recommended because if you don't, it's probably too powerful of a spot. The rest of the stuff in that first expansion, I could really go without. They don't really do much of anything. The second expansion is going to add um, extra amulets, special amulets, which I think you do need for your set collection to score maximum points. And it's going to offer a 50 and 100 point bonus prestige tile once you kind of loop the board. That should have been in there in the base game. It's nice to have it here. There's also these banknote tiles in both of these different expansions, but I don't think they're really needed. It just complicates the game a little too much. But overall, for round tiles, including its first and section expansion, I'm going to give these games a play. It's a solid game, good artwork, good mechanics, some interesting decisions, but none of the kind of interesting thematical complexity that you would expect from this theme or from the double rondelle. I love the look of that double rondelle, but it, yeah, like, it's funny. Like I've heard people talk about this game and like, it's a lot of like middling to high middling reviews of like, it's fine. It doesn't do as much as you think it would with that second rondelle. I really wish it did though. Like looks really cool on the table. 
Yeah, it's just a little too easy. You know, when you play a Matt Gertz game and you have those rondelles, you really agonize over every decision and every step that you take. Here you get two family members and it's not that problematic. You really gonna get pretty much everything you need. In all of the games I played, I was never in a tense moment where I wasn't gonna have enough money or enough resources. And that's fine for a light to medium weight game. You just expect more when it comes to rondelles. Yeah, for sure. All right, Anthony. So that's the game that's hitting our table. Let's talk about our feature review. So for our feature review, we're going back to an oldie but a goodie and one that everyone loves. If you like, dot, 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 try out these other games. So we are talking about Century Spice Road because it popped up again. Eastern Wonders is out there. And you can kind of work those two games together. But we wanted to talk about Century Spice Road because it's becoming a mainstay as far as gateway gaming is concerned. If you don't know, Century Spice Road is from Plan B Games. It's basically a card drafting mechanic where you're building up a little tableau of cards in your hand in order to kind of run a little bit of machine. So you are gaining spices and then you are transforming spices into other spices in order to be able to complete contracts on the board. That's pretty much it. Beautiful artwork, great production, and it's something that definitely everyone should check out one time or the other if you're looking for a great gateway game. But we want to talk about being able to collect resources as a mechanic and complete those contracts. It's a really fun mechanic. If you haven't played a game like that before, it really gets gateway gamers really engaged. And we want to talk about some heavier games. You've already played Century Spice Road and you like it. We want you to try out these other games. All right, Anthony, why don't you start us off with the first game? All right, number one on this list is one of my favorite Euro games, period. Uh, The Voyages of Marco Polo. And it kind of has a similar theme. You are traveling along this uh, spice road and you are gathering different resources in the form of camels and spices and silk and gold. And you are using those to complete different contracts. So there's a lot of things you can do in this game. You can travel... You can get different bonuses, but the bulk of your victory points are going to come from contracts, which you start the game with one, uh, sometimes two, and then you can pick up new ones through actions you take. And ultimately, you want to turn those different resources you've collected into those contracts and complete them for as many points as possible. And some of those contracts are going to give you additional bonuses. You get things back from them. Um, Sometimes you get bonus actions or camels or whatever it is, special movement. Um, You want to chain them together as best as you can, but the core idea of this game is completing the contracts while you move along the map, and balancing that while trying to maintain the different die values that you have, because the game is all dice-based, is a whole lot of fun, and it makes every single play different, combined with the different, you know, player powers of your specific characters. One of my favorite Euros, still, even after all these other games that have come out that kind of iterate on that formula. That's Voyages of Marco Polo. Well, another great game, and a little bit heavier, but a lot more fun, is Takanoko. This is by Anton Balza, and it's about this panda and this gardener going around, and you are trying to complete these different missions. Now, these missions range from eating the right types of bamboo, growing the right types of bamboo, and then putting together the right pieces of land based upon these different colors that are available in the game. So basically the farmer goes around and is planting, the panda's going around and eating the bamboo, and you are placing these tiles in order to maximize your score. It's a really fun, dynamic, interesting game. It's light enough that it's going to engage gateway gamers, but it's just heavy enough that a that a hardcore gamer will find a lot of love in this game. And that's Takanako. All right, next one on the list here is Grand Austria Hotel. Another game with a lot of variability in it, just like Marco Polo, which tends to be the kind of games I like. Um, in this game, you're going to have multiple slots in front of you for patrons that are looking for different combinations of cake and coffee and wine and various other goods. Um, there are people visiting your hotel. They want to be fed well. They want good beverages. And to make them happy, you're going to collect different cubes to fulfill those orders. And then when you do fulfill those orders and complete your contracts, 
you're going to flip doors from open to close in your hotel and score different points at the end of the game. Lots of different ways these things interact with each other, um, different cards and mechanisms and actions you can take that influence um, your ability to complete these different orders or influence what you get out of closing these different doors based on the combinations you get. But the basic idea is gather these goods, f make these patrons happy, and then close their doors to say, hey, this person's in our hotel, they're happy, and very much like Marco Polo, that that is going to be the core of the game. So that is Grand Austria Hotel. Well, next up is the Pursuit of Happiness. Now, what looks to be an upgraded life is actually a really dynamic and interesting set collection game in which you're trying to be able to collect the right resources in order to get the right mate, the right job, the right activities, and basically score the most victory points by having the most successful and thrilling lifetime as possible. If you live a healthy and well-maintained lifetime and don't stress out too much, those set collections are not such a bad thing when you're trying to pursue your own happiness. All right, next on the list is Yeddo. Yeddo is a game of... A mixture of different things. You are trying to complete different missions, sometimes interacting or taking down your opponents, but also trying to gather different things to complete these missions. So it's a mixture of the kind of the traditional Euro where you're building up an engine and completing different things. You don't lose the things you're using, which is nice, but also occasionally hurting other people. So you kind of balance those two things out. Um, as you go, you're going to gather the different assets you need and most importantly, try to kind of manipulate and outfox the different people you're working with and prevent them from completing their own missions. Some of these missions at the higher levels, if you're playing the game at the highest level, can be kind of nasty and they can hurt other people. The earlier levels and medium levels, if you're playing the game at the basic um, introductory level, it's not as interactive as kind of the high level of the game. Some of those top level cards can even end the game immediately if you get everything you need to complete it. Lots of different options here for a worker placement game and lots of different things to kind of keep in your head and manage and maintain as you try to just determine where you want to go, how you want to proceed, and whether you want to just kind of build your own engine or interact with other people around the map and keep them from doing the things that you're afraid they're going to do. That's Yeddo. All right, and finally, we have a game that was an oldie but a goodie and recent Kickstarter that will be hitting stores pretty soon. This is Finca. Now, Finca is a really interesting game, and you're trying to collect sets of fruit in order to complete contracts that are on the board that require a certain number of fruit. Now, what's really interesting and dynamic about this game is it's, so it's part Rondell and part Moncala because you are moving your workers around this Rondell in order to collect the right number of fruit in order to maintain those contracts. And if you do, then not only will you be able to pick up those contracts, but you'll also be able to pick up bonus contracts for meeting the right conditions that are necessary throughout the game. It's fun, it's fast, it's colorful. It's a great Euro game. It still engages the gateway people, but that Rondell mechanic is going to get those hardcore gamers really engaged in the set collection mechanic. All right, so those are six great games that will take you to the next level if you like Century Spice Road. All right, so that's everything for this week. Until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you all a seat at the table.